modernity places a premium on being nice. We see this in the progressive adulation of Fred Rogers, the host of the preschool television series Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, as America's one true hero because he was just so darn nice. We also see this in how modern Christians talk endlessly of God's love and forgiveness while downplaying some of the more fire and brimstone aspects of the faith. And we see this in corporations that impose a culture of inoffensiveness through their HR departments. No matter where you look, the idea of just being nice seems to dominate our culture to the point where some people seem to think you could construct an entire ethical system around niceness or tolerance. This phenomenon is an example of the left's tendency to take traditional virtues and recontextualize them to fit their preconceived worldview. It has always struck me how, in a lot of modern dialogues about what is moral or immoral, leftists will often appeal to ideas like kindness, charity, or fairness to promote their political policies. Yet in spite of this, many of them resist embracing the virtue ethics framework, usually redefining those virtues in consequentialist terms. For example, a leftist might appeal to a notion of fairness because it will lead to a desired outcome, such as the end of capitalism. But I believe this to be a mistake. The virtue ethics framework can be very useful in understanding a lot of modern moral quandaries. In fact, that's what I intend to do with this channel. The Greek philosopher Aristotle is perhaps the most famous virtue ethicist to this day. He laid out a lot of his views in the Nicomachean Ethics, a book often recommended by philosophy majors for being so foundational to Western ethics. Aristotle argued that a virtuous person is someone who has certain ideal character traits. These traits are derived from natural tendencies, but need to be nurtured until they become habit. For example, the virtue of courage derives from our natural tendency to be fearless. However, one must practice being fearless in order to become courageous. An important concept when discussing Aristotelian virtue ethics is the idea of the golden mean, which Aristotle discussed in Book 2 of the Nicomachean Ethics. Aristotle characterizes each virtue as a mean between two extremes, which he refers to as vices. One is a vice of deficiency, having too little of a certain desired trait, while the other is a vice of excess, having too much of that trait. For example, between the vice of recklessness and the vice of cowardice lies the virtue of bravery. Both recklessness and cowardice involve having unreasonable levels of fearlessness, but the former is a vice of excessive fearlessness, while the latter is a vice of deficient fearlessness. The virtue of courage represents the right level of fearlessness a good, reasonable person needs. So what does this have to do with niceness? Is it a virtue? Well, most definitions of niceness I've found seem to define it as being synonymous with friendliness, and, lo and behold, Aristotle considered friendliness to be a virtue. The Aristotelian philosopher Thomas Aquinas described friendliness as consisting of merely outward actions, which differentiates it from true friendship. He writes, quote, Since virtue is directed to good, Wherever there is a special kind of good, there must needs be a certain kind of virtue. Now good consists in order, and it behooves man to be maintained in a becoming order towards other men as regards their mutual relations with one another, in point of both deeds and words, so that they behave towards one another in a becoming manner. Hence the need of a special virtue that maintains the becomingness of this order and this virtue is called friendliness." Unquote. Under the framework of virtue ethics, friendliness is a virtue because the good man must live in an orderly society, and constantly feeling uncomfortable isn't conducive to such a society. Friendliness engenders social cohesion. The polite social utterances and manners friendliness consists of make living with others more enjoyable and foster the social relations necessary to form real relationships. They are called pleasantries because they make living together more pleasant. But if friendliness is a virtue, then there must be two corresponding vices. 
Meanness is clearly a vice of deficiency, sure, but there are problems with excessive friendliness too. As St. Thomas explained, quote, For the sake of some good that will result, or in order to avoid some evil, the virtuous man will sometimes not shrink from bringing sorrow to those among whom he lives. For this reason, we should not show a cheerful face to those who are given to sin, in order that we may please them, lest we seem to consent to their sin, and in a way, encourage them to sin further. Although the friendship of which we have been speaking, or affability, intends chiefly the pleasure of those among whom one lives, yet it does not fear to displease when it is a question of obtaining a certain good or of avoiding a certain evil. Accordingly, if a man were to wish always to speak pleasantly to others, he would exceed the mode of pleasing, and would therefore sin by excess. If he do this with the mere intention of pleasing, he is said to be complacent, according to the philosopher." Unquote. To be complacent in this sense is to be eager to please, and Aquinas correctly pins this down as a vice just as opposed to genuine friendliness as meanness is. We can see complacence in the brown-nosed yes-man looking to please his boss, or in the obnoxious teacher's pet, and it disgusts us. But flatterers aren't the only complacent people out there. People trying really hard to be as inoffensive as possible can become complacent too as are people who are weak-willed and easy to push around. Such complacence disgusts us because we know on an instinctive level that these people are unreliable and untrustworthy. They are the kind of people willing to bend their moral standards in order to appease others. A truly friendly person wouldn't hesitate to tell his friend some hard truths that they need to hear, but a complacent person would help his friend off a cliff. This discussion of complacence versus genuine friendliness is important because a lot of people conflate the two, and this is especially true with regards to political correctness. Now, I'm sure most of the people watching this video already know about political correctness, so I won't describe it in length. In short, it's a term used to describe the language, policies, or measures intended to avoid offending or otherwise harming particular groups in society progressives believe to be oppressed or marginalized. The term has been a part of our discourse since at least the 90s. Commentators from varying ideological persuasions have talked about the problems with political correctness. One such commentator, the neo-reactionary distributist, pointed out in one of his videos that political correctness is often defended by progressives as just another form of politeness. Section 1. What is political correctness? Political correctness, or PC, describes efforts to curtail language and behavior which offends disadvantaged or marginalized people. That's it. That's it. That's the whole thing. Well, then, that doesn't actually sound that bad. Why is everybody so screechingly, unendingly furious about it? I think he was onto something there. Now, while the distributist did push back against this notion in his video, I'm going to use a different tactic. For the sake of argument, I will concede that political correctness is just politeness, but I will not concede that it's a good thing. Taking a cue from Aristotelian virtue ethics, I argue that adherence to political correctness is a vice of complacence born from the modern fetishization of niceness. People are so afraid of being mean that they become complacent. This complacence leads them to accepting politically correct norms propagated by powerful institutions. This complacence has even infected the purported foes of political correctness. Charlie Kirk, the leader of the pro-Trump student organization Turning Point USA, has purged people from his organization for even appearing in a photograph with the controversial Nicholas J. Fuentes. Ben Shapiro, a conservative superstar oft quoted for saying, Facts don't care about your feelings, went into a 40-minute rant full of emotional outrage, politically correct buzzwords, and straw man versions of Nick Fuentes' arguments, and then refused to debate him because Fuentes killed a video game character that looked like Shapiro and joked about it. And all this fury about Fuentes? Well, it's because Fuentes made a joke about the Holocaust. Way to go, conservatives. But to truly demonstrate that political correctness is complacence, I believe it'd be fitting 
to use a proponent of political correctness. Enter Thoughtslime. Thoughtslime is, in his own words, a smug anarchist poser that creates leftoid propaganda. On his channel, he has a video entitled Why PC Culture Kinda Rules. In the description, he writes, PC culture, what is? How come people get mad about it? Spoiler alert, it's mostly dumb stuff. Well, having an honest dialogue shut down by an angry mob, or having your reputation destroyed by large media conglomerates isn't exactly dumb stuff, but perhaps he addresses these concerns in his video. Thought Slime's video is really aimed at the liberal notion of freedom of speech, and he takes special glee in attacking the kind of free speech absolutism proposed by people like Sargon of Akkad or Count Dankula. But in his discussion of rights, he never talks about what is right. But there are plenty of other examples of speech that cannot be protected. <clears throat> False advertising, lying in court, slander and libel, fraud, divulging doctor-patient privileged information, plagiarism, and most important and relevant to hate speech laws, threats. Threats cannot be tolerated and do not constitute free speech. None of these people actually believes in free speech absolutism, since, as Thought Slime rightfully points out, it would legalize things like incitement to violence or libel. But in all other aspects, the video fails to get to the heart of the issue. Thought Slime tries to argue that freedom of speech is not freedom from consequences, so if you say something politically incorrect, then you shouldn't be surprised when some major institution deplatforms you. But whether or not a particular institution has the right to deplatform some right-winger isn't the most important question. The important question is whether or not they are right to deplatform the right-winger. Many people arguing against deplatforming have pointed out that universities are supposed to be places where controversial ideas are discussed and debated, and that the deplatforming of offensive right-wingers constitutes a betrayal of the university's original mission. Another point often brought up is how social media platforms like Twitter or Facebook are the new public town square, and the exclusion of certain controversial voices prevents necessary conversations from happening in the public square, harming discourse as a whole. But Thought Slime never addresses these arguments. Because he's politically opposed to the right, he's prejudged all right-wingers to be apologists for prejudice, and assumes the institutions are right for kicking them out. Besides this blatant question-begging, Thought Slime says many things contradicting his own anarchism. For instance, he assumes that these neoliberal institutions, such as the Canadian government, the university system, or social media websites, are fair in their enforcement of political correctness and aren't using it as a means to maintain the system. As a leftist, shouldn't he be skeptical of what these rich, powerful people do? This is especially pertinent in the context of Canadian politics, since Thought Slime is a Canadian. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was revealed to have engaged in blackface probably more times than all the living members of the KKK combined. Where are the consequences for his actions? In fact, one could look at modern political correctness as an outgrowth of late capitalism as a way for the liberal elites to defend their position in the hierarchy using the various minority groups as proxy warriors. Hate speech is used to censor dissidents. Mass immigration from the third world is meant to compete with the native working class in a race to the bottom. Pandering to quote-unquote minority groups could be a means of opening up new markets to make up for the declining native populations. Goldman Sachs is one of the largest investment banks in the world. It's also America's largest underwriter of initial public offerings, the often highly lucrative moment when a private company goes public. Goldman Sachs has always chosen its IPOs based on financial criteria on what's the best possible business decision. But not anymore. Goldman has decided to join the revolution. The company has announced it will no longer underwrite IPOs for companies whose boards contain too many white men, because white men are bad except apparently for the white men who run Goldman Sachs. They're the exception. They're great. Confused? Well, it gets even more muddled. Goldman Sachs has also announced that its new diversity policy will not apply to Asia. 
The leadership of Chinese companies tends to be utterly and completely homogenous. Diversity is definitely not their strength. And that's fine with Goldman Sachs. In other words, homogenous boards are a sin when they happen here in America, but in China, they're totally fine, not to mention highly lucrative. Well, if all of this seems inconsistent, even hypocritical, don't be surprised. Goldman specializes in that. The company's website, for example, contains this preachy little sermon on gender diversity. Quote, Goldman Sachs believes that when women lead, everything changes. In today's world, gender equality is an economic imperative, and supporting women's economic empowerment and leadership opportunities will drive growth for our clients, our communities, our people, and our shareholders. Great, but they don't mean it. How do we know? Well, Goldman's board doesn't have parity between men and women. When the company's previous CEO, Lloyd Blankfein, stepped down in 2018, they didn't pick a woman to replace him. No, they picked David Solomon, who looks very much like Lloyd Blankfein. Solomon didn't have to take the job. He could have stood aside and let a woman run Goldman Sachs for the first time in 150 years. Or even better, he could have stepped down from his job. He could do it tonight, and he should and then demand that a non-binary person replace him immediately and donate his severance to Black Lives Matter. But needless to say, he won't do that. Diversity for thee, but not for me. That's the real motto at Goldman Sachs. But, but I thought I was resisting the power. Like, I'm just fighting the white supremacist system. I'm just standing here for the black lives because the system right now just doesn't value them. I mean, is that right? I mean, I'm, where I'm, the reason why everyone's rioting is because they're not unheard. Everyone's just ignoring them. No, honey, that is not the right. That's not what's going on. Is it? I mean, is is it a, um, just from the base off the off the top of my head? I've seen these just, and I don't even have to look up for these. These are just something I remember he, seeing on like the on Twitter, and you know, I saw like all these big multinational corporations: Twitter, Amazon, Google, Xbox, PlayStation, Netflix, Microsoft, Citigroup. All the, these big media corporations from CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, NBC, you know, they are all saying variations of Black Lives Matter, we must bless our black employees, we must fix the system, etc. So are we sticking it to the man and having Amazon, you know, is like, and we're like, you know, raising our fist with Amazon, Netflix, and Microsoft? It's basically, no. You've been brainwashed throughout your life, and you're just spitting it out because the media is telling you to be outraged. This isn't anything new. This isn't anything special. Thought Slime does bring up this point in his video, but he still holds political correctness as it currently exists to be a good thing. How does he reconcile this contradiction? Argument number seven. Political correctness is the mechanism by which the political elite can grant token acceptance to people who don't challenge their supremacy while still maintaining the apparatuses of oppression to those that fall outside the boundaries of acceptability. Yeah, but, um, no, cause, oh wait, uh. Oh, that's right. He ducks away like a coward because the argument is too complicated for him. The sheer audacity of this would be impressive if he had an ounce of self-awareness. Another contradiction can be found in his claim that non-state actors cannot violate one's right to freedom of speech. This ignores the constant threat to civil liberties coming from corporations, something leftists have been complaining about for decades. In the real world, the vast majority of citizens simply must work for large corporations if they are going to work at all, creating an economic dependency on a centralized authority. Conformity to corporate values becomes, in effect, a precondition of the very possibility of feeding oneself. This is one of the reasons why left-wing anarchists believe anarcho-capitalists to be fake anarchists. For how can one be against state monopolies while tacitly supporting monopolies created by private property? Thoughtsline has to be aware of this line of reasoning, yet it never seems to factor into his argument. What could account for such nonsense? While one could convincingly argue that Thought Slime is a neoliberal apologist dishonestly posing as an anarchist, our earlier analysis of political correctness provides a much better explanation. Thought Slime is complacent. He is driven by a desire to be as pleasing and inoffensive as he possibly can. This would neatly explain many of his quirks. His self-deprecation is an attempt to appear as non-threatening as possible, for who could be afraid of an idiot? His corny, 
unfunny quote-unquote humor is a symptom of his unwillingness to be offensive. His apologies for neoliberalism are a manifestation of his desire to appease the reigning orthodoxy, which is neoliberal and technocratic in nature. He has become what Aquinas would have called an effeminate man, someone who withdraws from good on account of sorrow caused by lack of pleasure. Thought Slime is willing to make videos filled with self-deprecation and apologies for neoliberalism to make himself a total bongo for the sake of maintaining an audience of sycophants. Rather than pursue the truth wherever it may lead, he does whatever he can to avoid displeasing the people he cares about. Now, some may argue that this analysis isn't valid because Thought Slime isn't representative of the left in general. By his own admission, Thought Slime is not a particularly intelligent or moral person, and there are many intelligent and well-intentioned leftists. But I think he does provide an interesting case study, given how common the characterization of political correctness as politeness is in our wider society. Thought Slime's behavior serves as a caution to progressives that their eagerness to be nice may result in cowardice and inconsistency. Even intelligent and well-intentioned people can fall into moral error. Some right-wingers may resist the characterization of political correctness as complacence. They'd point to progressives whose behavior demonstrates a deficiency of friendliness, like Anita Sarkeesian or Anna Kasparian. And indeed, Thought Slime makes several impolite jokes throughout the video. But I believe these examples are the exceptions that prove the rule. First, these are all either media personalities with a great deal of institutional power or hardcore ideologues. They aren't followers of political correctness, they're its enforcers. They aren't representative of most people of the politically correct mindset. In fact, part of the reason PC culture has such a grip on our society is because so many effeminate men support it. In addition to having a smaller platform than the likes of these high-profile women, Thought Slime is, non-binary status aside, almost identical to a white male. As a result, he's lower in the progressive victim hierarchy than women like Anita Sarkeesian. It would make sense for then for him to be driven more by complacence than by ideological commitment. Second, Thought Slime's rude comments are aimed at people that have been blacklisted by the power structures he's trying to appease. Progressives aren't immune to tribalism, and once they have an other group, they can insult that group with impunity because they deserve it. In fact, insulting this outside group may be seen as laudable by the progressives in question. In Thought Slime's case, the outgroup consists in people that disagree with him on political correctness. What motivates Thought Slime to promote political correctness as a form of politeness also motivates him to disparage right-wingers. Proponents of political correctness defend it as a way to protect marginalized groups from bullies, and on its face, it does seem to fit our moral intuitions. After all, what kind of person would pick on the lowliest of society? Surely not you. But political correctness is a problem if you have to have honest discussions about difficult subjects. If there is an injustice and you do not speak out against it out of fear of harming marginalized groups, you encourage that injustice. If other people are doing something stupid and you do not warn them out of a fear of them calling you hateful, you are encouraging their stupidity. If bracingly frank and unpleasant talk is what's called for, then political correctness is a vice, no matter who finds it offensive. And this all ties back to what I was talking about at the beginning, modernity. Modernity has undoubtedly made men effeminate, a fact not lost on the dissident right. From the advent of the Coomer meme to the abundance of self-help videos, the dissident right is on the ball when they talk about things like pornography addiction and obesity. But effeminacy can cause men to indulge in other vices than lust or gluttony. The rampant political correctness of our era is but another form of the consumerist pursuit of pleasure. So, if we want to end political correctness, if we want to have honest dialogue, then we must address the problems of modernity itself.